Grab a Bible if you want. We are in this series called Heart of a Servant. Last week we gave away these towels. We said Jesus picked up a towel. He did not lean on his title. He picked up a towel. Uh, We gave all of those away, hundreds and hundreds of towels. I hope that you brought it maybe to your office and set it on your chair. And when you want to kill your cubicle partner, you know what I mean? You look at that towel and think, well, I can't kill him today, you know, because I got this towel and I'd have to clean up their blood with all of this and that wouldn't be good. So whatever it is that uh, you go into your house, you know, and lay it on on your recliner, your husband's recliner and be like, I'm here to serve. I'm going to do whatever it is. I got a heart of a servant. I hope that you do that. Uh, We're in week two today and... um, I want to talk about comfort. I'm at the age uh, now where I choose comfort over style. Can I get a good amen, everybody? Um, A few years ago, uh, Brandy uh, bought me a new pair of shoes, and she told me when she bought them, she said, now these are running shoes. If you're new to our church, we have a rule in our church family. There there are probably about a 1,000 people that call this place home, but hundreds of families here, and I've asked all of you, I'm, I'm asking you again now, Uh, I live in the area. If you ever, look at my eyes. If you ever, ever, ever see me outside running, I'm asking you to stop and help me. Somebody's chasing me. (laughs) Somebody's out to get me. There's There's a wolverine. There's a chupacabra. Somebody's out to give me. And I need help. And I reminded my wife of this when she said, I bought you some running shoes. That the only, unless she's going to unleash something on me to chase me, I'm not, you got the wrong brother, Okay. I'm, I'm, if I'm not running from it, I'm not running. And, uh, and she said, no, these are, these are hokas. And, and a hoka tennis shoe, even though it's a running shoe, it's built for comfort. It's built for comfort. Anybody know? Has anybody ever seen this? They're built for comfort. And so, and so I wore them, and it was like walking on baby angels, everybody. It was just, and now I got five pair of hokas. I'm not, a, I'm not I listen. And they kind of look like orthotics, like an old man, you know, that's got one leg shorter than the other. I don't care. If they had Velcro on the top, I'd still wear them. It doesn't matter to me because I'm at the age of comfort over style. Say amen to that. This happened in our marriage a few years ago. We got married when we were really young. And when you're young and dumb, anything works, you know, and your furniture, you kind of hobble it together and, you know, what what you got. And and we had done that through our 20s and maybe even into our 30s some, and especially as it related to our mattress and our bed but there came a point in my mid-30s approaching 40 when we decided we're going to actually have to buy a real big boy mattress are y'all with me on this everybody over 40 feels where I'm at right now some of you 20 year olds are thinking what's your problem but you just wait these hips are my problem that's what my problem is so so we went and bought, and we went and got, the, I mean, we bought, you know, we bought, we bought a Tempur-Pedic. We bought the best of the best. We took out a small loan for a European country we could have bought, and we bought the nicest mattress we could buy. It's got the thing that goes up, and the, the, you know, the head and the thing, and the feet, and, it, you know, full, it's basically a hospital bed. We bought a hospital bed for our house <laughs> because I am all about comfort at this stage of my life. Yeah. Say amen to that. I've already told you, I keep my house on 68 degrees. I tell my wife, I'll pay whatever the bill is. I work too hard to sweat on the inside. Not going to do it. I sweat outside, but when I'm at home, we're not going to sweat on the inside. Y'all come to church here, bring you a little sweater, a little Afghan. We're not going to sweat unless we're getting after it. Are y'all with me, everybody? I just, I, I just, I'm at the point in my life where comfort matters. Now, here's the problem, is that oftentimes we use that same I want comfort. I want, I want comfort in every area of my life. It bleeds over into our spiritual life. And it bleeds over into our faith life. And we end up sacrificing the call of God on our life because it's not comfortable. Write this in your notes like this. Comfort and calling don't go hand in hand. Comfort and calling don't go hand in hand. I grew up going to the mall. Anybody remember the mall when they were indoors? Y'all remember those? I don't know why they, we still have malls, we just, they're outside anyway, but we used to have indoor malls, and when mama would drop me off at the indoor mall, my favorite store was Sharper Image, and you'd go to the Sharper Image, 
and at the front of the sharper image. They didn't put them in the back. In the back, they put electronics and all this kind of stuff. But at the very front, they put those massage chairs, the big old giant massage. looked like an, an egg. You know what I'm talking about on this? And man, you'd get in there and you lose all sense of dignity inside of the sharper image. You completely forget that the whole world's passing by. <laughs> and you lose time and energy. You just, and I, I mean, I just like it to be comfortable right there. And a lot of people take that same recliner and massage chair and nice tennis shoes and a comfortable bed and we insert our spiritual life into our comfort. The problem is comfort and calling rarely go hand in hand. Ask Jonah how comfortable it is to follow the call of God. And in Western Christianity, we like God that's comfortable. I'll do this if it makes sense. I'll give that if it's comfortable. I'll show up if I got time. But comfort and my calling rarely go hand in hand. I want to show it to you today in God's Word. If you have a Bible, I'm in Luke, the 10th chapter. Luke, the 10th chapter, while you're turning there, I'll, I'll set up this story for you. You've probably read this before. This is the account of the Good Samaritan. This is the only place this shows up in all of the Bible. Uh, Luke has 10, actually, 10 stories that show up nowhere else. And, uh, and this is one of those stories that Luke is recanting that, no, that none of the other synoptic gospels uh, cover the... A good Samaritan, Luke 10 and verse 25. I'm reading from the New King James Version. If you have it, say amen. Amen. Good. Two people brought the Bibles. (laughs) Good. Good. Luke 10 and verse 25. The rest of you look on the screen. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him. I don't have time to teach it to you, but the church is always going to be full of people who stand up and question everything. Why is it so cold? Why is it so hot? Why is it so loud? Why is it so quiet? Why is it so dark? Why is it so bright? Why is he so good looking? I don't know what else you could think of or just, I'm just trying to think of things that I've heard before. What (laughs) there, I'm kidding. I'm I'm, I'm, going to preach hard to you. So I got to wake you up. I got to get you laughing. Lawyer stood up and questioned Jesus and said, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now look me in the eyes. This is a good question. It's a good question all of us should be asking. Like, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? Like, tell me, tell me what, what's required. There's more to this life than this life. So tell me what that means. Verse 26, Jesus said to the teacher of the law, what is written in the law? How do you interpret it? What's your reading of it? I, I love, I wish I had the same intestinal fortitude that Jesus had as a pastor because They come to him to test him, and Jesus says, I don't know. You're a know-it-all. You tell me what it says. You tell me what you think the law says. Verse 27. So he answered and said, the the lawyer, well, here's what I think the law says. You, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and you you should love your neighbor as yourself. Verse 28, Jesus said to the lawyer, that's right, you've answered this correctly. That is, in fact, what it takes to inherit eternal life. If you'll do this, you'll live. You do this, you'll live. Verse 29, this is where I find a lot of Christians is in verse 29. I want to help us today. But he, the lawyer, wanting to justify himself, underline that in your Bible. Wanting to justify himself. This is where, as a pastor, I find a lot of people. Most people don't make an appointment with me to actually get spiritual advice. They make an appointment with me for me to bless whatever it is they're going to do anyway. I told you all I'm coming for bodies today. Y'all don't know. I, <laughs> I warned you with the jokes. I'm done with the jokes. Most people just want to justify. Pastor, what do you think about us getting married? I mean, I already bought the ring. The wedding's in two weeks. We already have the honeymoon paid for. She has the dress. You think it's okay that we get married? Sure, brother. Bring me some cake. I mean, I, you, didn't, you didn't come for it. You know what I mean? Like, like, you already decided what you're going to do about all of this. Just, yeah, man, you just want. And, and, and the teacher of the law, in other words, I'm asking a question. I already know where I'm going. And this is, what, this is where he went. I, I want to justify myself and said to Jesus, oh, yeah, 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 I knew you were going to say that. Who is my neighbor? 
I just want to know. Jesus answers. Hey, uh, 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 listen, uh, I, you answered correctly. That's the law. And, and then the lawyer immediately says, okay, I knew you were going to say that. I knew I was right about that. I just, I actually, I wanted to ask you this question. So I asked you that question so I could get to this question. What I really want to know is, do I actually have to love everybody? Like what I'm really asking you, Jesus, is, is this neighbor thing really mean everybody or can I pick and choose my neighbors? Because I got some neighbors, I'm trying to put antifreeze so I kill their cats. I got other neighbors I'm good with. And I just want to... Oh, y'all never done that? Okay. I'm from the, I'm from the south side of the kingdom. Y'all don't know about me. I, I, I just want to know who my neighbor is. Let me say it to you a different way. Watch this. Listen. I'm just looking for the bare minimum to get in to the kingdom. I just wanted to know, could you boil that? Oh, yeah, love, I, I get it. Serving, I, I get it. Heart, soul, mind, strength, I get all that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, what's the minimum I can do and still get in? When you go to take a test in college, you know, the, the, they always, the, the, every time I talk to a college person, they begin when I say, how'd you do? They start with, well, I had to have a 60 to pass. <laughs> Here's what that means. I just need to know. The minimum. I just need to know what's it going to take for me to get to next semester. I just need to know, Jesus, watch me now. What is it going to take? I don't want to be generous. I just want to know the bare minimum. How much do I actually have to serve? How much do I actually have to tithe? Do I have to tithe 10% of my gross or 10% of my net? Do I tithe 10% when I sell a car? Do I tithe 10% when? Do I tithe 10% after I, I pay all my bills? Do I tithe 10% on just what I can? Do I have to tithe 10%? What about 9.5%? Can I bargain with God and get to 5%? Can I tithe 5% every other week? That gives me to 10% every month. I just want to know what's the minimum. Who's my neighbor? I just want to know, what's the least amount I can serve and still be on the dream team? I know y'all need, I, I, I get it, I, I, we're churches in revival, I get we're reaching a bunch of people. I just want to know, can I serve once every six weeks, but only on odd days? I can't serve on even Sundays because there's something about that in the moon and does all the thing. I can't do that. And then I can, I can only serve in the winter because I'm really hot natured and I can't, so winter and even, I just want to know what the minimum is, y'all need me on the team. I just want to know what the minimum of love is. Do I really have to love everybody? I only like people who vote like me. Do I really have to love everybody? Do I really have to forgive everybody? And we mask our minimums in spiritual language. We mask our minimums in spiritual language. I just want to know how to inherit eternal life. No, no, no. You just want to know what the minimum you can do and still make it. And the truth of the matter is, listen to me, we should be asking as Jesus followers, how much can I love? How much can I give? How much can I serve? We don't look for the cheap way out. I don't want the minimum. I want to max out on what I'm giving to God. I want to max out generosity. I want to max out serving and love and forgiveness and grace. Why? Because God didn't take the minimum with me. For God so loved the world that he gave. It's not the minimum. And this teacher of the law says, I just want to know what the minimum is to get by. We ought to be maxing out grace. I want you to be a church that maxes out forgiveness. I want you to be a church that maxes out serving. Well, what's the minimum I can serve? What's the minimum I can be generous? No, no, no. I'm looking for how can I do it more? How can I give more? How can we serve more? I told our team, this is a true story. Two weeks ago, you asked our associate pastor. I went into his office. I said, God woke me up in the middle of the night and told me to double whatever it is we're doing for serve day. You ask him. Julie's my assistant. She had no idea. She walked in that day. She had no idea. She had four days to double everything we were doing. Why? Because God woke me up and said, Are you, is that what, that's what you're going to do? We're just going to do the minimum? I said, oh, no, God. You've been too good to our church. That We're in revival right now. Let's double everything we're doing. Let's give away everything we can. Let's do all that we can. Let's, let's double our efforts in missions. Let's double our efforts in generosity. Let's double everything we're doing. Why? Because Jesus has been so good to us. I'm not looking for the cheap way out. I'm looking for how much can I give to God. 
I'm telling you, I'm preaching better than your amen. I will listen to this own podcast right by myself. <laughs> What's the minimum? So Jesus then tells a story. Now, I think it's a true story. I'll tell you why I think so in a minute. Verse 30. Jesus then answers with this story. And he says, this is the part you probably know. A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among thieves, and they stripped him of all of his clothes, and they wounded him, beat him up, departed, and they left him half dead. Um, I don't have time to teach it to you, but most of the people you encounter in this world are half dead. The world has beat and abused and stripped them of dignity and love and hope and left him half dead. Verse 31, now by chance a certain priest, everybody say a priest. priest. Now by chance a priest came down the road and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. He's over there. Whew. Whoa, let me get over here. <laughs> That's a mess over there. I don't know what that is. Passes by on the other side. Verse 32, likewise, a Levite. Sounds like a bad joke, right? A priest, a Levite, and a Samaritan walk into a bar. <laughs> right? Likewise, a Levite, watch this. When he arrived at the place, he did what? Read those next sentences. He did what? He... Ugh, that looks terrible. Mercy. Goes to the other side. Verse 33, but a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him. He bandaged his wounds. By the way, if you want to know what revival is, it's this. It bandages wounds, pours oil and wine on him, sets him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. Verse 35, and on the next day when he departed, he took out some money, two denarii, and he gave it to the innkeeper and said to him, I want you to take care of him. If you spend anything more, whatever you spend more, when I come again, I'll repay you. Verse 36, Jesus concludes the story. So, which of these three do you think was his neighbor to him that fell among thieves? And the, the lawyer, the teacher of the law said, he who showed mercy on him, then Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. I got, I, I spent too much time in my introduction. So I got just a few minutes to give you three viewpoints of serving. Three viewpoints of serving. If you're taking notes, write this down. If you're not taking notes, write this down anyway. I'm giving you three viewpoints of serving. Um, the reason I think this is a true story is because... Um, the 17-mile stretch from Jerusalem to Jericho is known to be a bad road. It's, it's most likely that people were, in fact, robbed and beat up and left for dead on this road. It's dark alleys. It's a place you don't want to get called up at night. And the first person to show up is the priest. And when the priest saw him, he walked on the other side. Write this in your notes. Here's the first viewpoint of, of, of serving. I, I just can't get involved. I can't get involved with all of that. I, that looks like a mess and I can't get involved with all that. That looks like too much work. I don't know what's going on over there. I don't want to know. I got my own stuff. I don't want to know what they're doing. I don't want to know what happened. I ain't asking no questions. I, don't, I cannot get involved with that. I'm a priest. I'm a priest. If I, 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 I got important things to do. I got places to be. I'm going to the temple. I got stuff I got to do. If I touch this man and he is in fact dead, I've now defiled myself. I got to go through ceremonial cleaning according to the law. By the way, this viewpoint of serving, I can't get involved, has a lot of spiritual people that talk like spiritual people, like the priest talks. I just can't seem to, I just can't get involved. Pastor, I would serve, but I've been praying about where to serve. God hadn't showed me yet. You've been praying two and a half years about where to serve. It's the biggest prayer request you got. I just, God just hadn't showed me where he wants me yet. God just, I've been praying about tithing. I'm going to. I've just been praying about it. I don't know what I'm supposed to do on that. I've been doing some research, just spiritual people, spiritual things. I really can't get committed to church because I've got two other Bible studies, and I appreciate Bible studies. I don't want you to hear what I'm saying is, is, is against Bible I, You can join as many as you want, but a Bible study is not a local church. 
A Bible study is not a local church. You need a pastor. You need spiritual family. You need a place you're accountable. You need a place you can give and serve and feed and are fed. Say amen to that, everybody. You need, you need, a, but, but I, I just can't get involved. I just, I got, I got too much to do. Have you seen my schedule? Look at my calendar. Life is full. I got vacations and I got trips. Y'all know the difference? Vacations are without your kids. Trips are with your kids. If you ever hear me say I took a trip, brother's tired. I took my kids. If mama and I go on vacation, come on somebody, it's good times in the Rose House, all right? We got no kids. I have not had a vacation this year, but I'm going to after revival in Jesus' name. And I'm going to leave them kids behind with all of y'all. <laughs> I got all this stuff, pastor. I would. Man, I would serve. I really would. I just can't get involved. I got all this stuff. I got this one thing. And then, and then I got that other thing. I forgot about that. And then when I, when I, I got this other thing, that's a big thing. And then I'm sure we got something on Thursday. I forgot what it is, but I know we got something on Thursday nights that we're supposed to do. And then TGIF comes on on Friday. I can't do anything on Friday night because I got to watch TGIF. And then it's the weekend and we got football and soccer and lacrosse and basket weaving and cheerleading and dance. And we got, and we, we got, I just can't do it. And then I got to watch football, lacrosse, baseball, softball. Look, I, I, I just can't. And then on Sundays, it's hard to get up. I mean, I get up every other day at the crack of 9, 930. But Sundays are hard to get there. I can't be there. I just can't. I, I would. I just can't get involved. And meanwhile, he's dying in the ditch. And the priest can't get involved. Now, I'm not saying your schedule isn't full. I actually think it is. I'm just asking, should we replace some stuff on our priestly schedule that doesn't matter with stuff that does? Should we leave some room for God to show us a need? Should I leave some space for God to tap me on the shoulder and go, Hey, I'm talking to you right now about leading a small group. Hey, I'm talking to you about leading in a kid's classroom. Hey, I'm talking to you about serving at Revival. Hey, I'm talking to you about inviting your friends and family. Is there some point in your life when you should say, I, 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 I know I'm busy, but I'm busy doing stuff that doesn't matter for eternity. I just can't get involved. I just, I just can't, I just, the priest is busy priesting, <laughs> you know, you know, and, and it's it, it, kind of one of these things like, what need? I had no idea. Oh my gosh, look at there. He was dead. Oh my gosh, I had no idea. I had no idea. Y'all needed help. I wish somebody would have said something. Well, I'm over here gasping for air. I just don't want to get involved. Here's the second thing. The Levite shows up. The Levite shows up. Now, here's, before I show you the point, here's what I want you to see. Two-thirds of the people in the story are religious people. There's only one sinner, and he's the good Samaritan. This story is not for sinners. This story is for us. Priest and a Levite. People that go to Bible studies, people that mentor people, people that, spiritual people. Right? The Levite shows up, and the Bible says, watch this. The Bible says the Levite shows up to the place and he goes and he looks. Whew. Man, that looks bad. Golly, does that hurt? That looks like it hurts. Ugh. All right, buddy. Good luck with all that. <laughs> Watch this. Here's the second viewpoint. I want to be informed. I just don't want to be involved. I want to be informed of needs. <laughs> Would you take this from a pastor that loves you? I hope that you, I hope that you will. I really hope you know I love you. I really hope you know I'm grateful for you. But I don't want you to be informed and not involved. Informed but not involved are people who like to tell other people how, how generous their church are. They're just not generous with their church. They like to be informed about Serve Day. Oh, I love it. I love the video. I love, man, we had hundreds of people in red shirt. They just don't want to get involved. They get close enough to look, just not close enough to actually do something. They like to see. I, I want to be able to say, oh, that's my church. They want to talk about it as if they're a part of it. They just don't actually take a part of it, right? It's like me with a gym. My brother William asked me the other day to join a gym with me. I said, man, I'm already part of two of them. I belong to two gyms. I, joining a third is not going to make me show up. Come on, somebody. 
I just like y'all to think I'm a part of a gym, so I pay every month just so I can carry the little tag around and go, oh, yeah, I go. <laughs> I don't know what the inside of it looks like. I have no idea. I bet it's great. I just want to, I want to be informed, not involved. I, these are the kind of people who, they like to say, that's my church. Oh, yeah, that's my church. How long have you been going there? I hadn't been in a minute. I hadn't been in a while. Hey, how about that new staff? New staff? We got new staff? Yeah, they've been there a year. Oh, well, I've, I've been busy. This last year has been crazy. I'm going to be honest with you. I hadn't been there in a while. What? I just like to talk about it. I like to look at it. I just don't want to actually do something with it. Let me say it like this. They like to be close enough to see the wounds of the person. They just don't want to be involved in the healing. I, they get close enough to see the man in the ditch. They just don't want to help pull him out of the ditch. They like to be close enough to tell the story. You won't believe what I saw on the way to Jericho today. They just don't want to be. They just don't want it to actually cost me anything. Here, here's, here's what I love about this story. The Samaritan. He says it cost me something for this. And the Levite said, listen, this is going to cost me too much time. I saw it. I see the need. I know we're growing. I know you need kids. I know you need small group leaders. I know you need parking team. I know you need more musicians and worship leaders. I've asked God for more musicians and worship leaders. I know that you've got it. I know that you need all of that. But I just, I, I want to be informed, not involved. I want to be able to tell people that's my church. I just, I, just, I want to be able to tell, I want my, I want the people in my, in my office to know I'm a Christian. I just don't want to actually pray with somebody in the office. I, I want the people at my doctor's office to know I'm a pastor. I just don't want them to ask me to pray for them. Like, if I, like I just don't want to. I want it to be informed. I just don't want to be involved. Because if I'm involved, it's probably going to cost me something, and I don't know. And the Levite, listen to me, he gets close enough to see the problem. He's just not going to get involved in the solution. I can't get involved, says the priest. The Levite says, I want to be informed. I want to, I want to look. I just don't want to be involved. And then the Samaritan comes along. The Samaritan is a half-breed. He's a mixed race. They're hated in Judea. They're half Jew, half Gentile. The Gentiles don't like them, don't receive them because they're half Jewish. The Jews don't like them or receive them because they're half, half Gentile. And, and it's, it's a mess and... And so he's on the road to Jericho and he sees the man in the ditch and the priest says, I can't get involved. And the Levite says, I want to be informed, but I'm not going to be involved. And the good Samaritan, number three, says, I have to get involved. I have to get involved. I have to do something. I got to do something about this. Listen to me. Look at me. I've seen too much to not get involved. Like I just can't keep seeing all the need and keep passing by. I've seen a need and I got to do everything in my power to meet that need. I'm not looking for the cheap way out. I'm not looking for the bare minimum on the dream team. I'm not looking for the bare minimum to serve my city. I'm not looking for the bare minimum in generosity or in forgiveness or in grace. I'm not looking to do what I have to do. I'm saying, what, what could I do with this man? And he binds up his wounds. And he pours oil and wine. By the way, that's a type of the Holy Spirit. It's the reason why we are a spirit-filled church. Because you can have your wounds bound up, but you need oil on top of all of that stuff to actually heal what, what the world did to you. And he pours oil and wine on him. Puts him on his animal. Takes him to an end. I, I want you as a church family. Come on, I'm almost done. I want you as a church family. As an individual, I want you to get to the point where you can't walk past a need. I can't keep walking past this need. I can't keep walking past this broken person. Don't be the church that just walks past broken people and hurting people saying, man, I hope some church helps that addict. I really hope some church comes along and does something. Don't be the church who just posts about a generation going to hell and you don't lead a youth small group. I don't want to be the church that talks about the next generation and how bad it's going to be without being a church who invests in the next generation. 
I don't want to be the kind of pastor who posts on Instagram, we need revival after an assassination attempt and not be the kind of pastor who doesn't lead you into revival. I know too much. I've seen too much. I got to do something. I I can't keep walking past struggling couples. Look at me. If you're over the age of 50, look into my eyes. I need you to invest in young couples. There are young couples in this service who are struggling and will divorce if they don't get help. You've been married 30 years, 40 years. I need you. You haven't haven't done your time because you're 60, because you're 70. You haven't done your time yet. I need you. If you're a young couple in this church, you're in your 20s and 30s. I'm telling you the most vibrant people who serve in this church are over the age of 60. And that should not be. We have vibrancy in youth. You're 28. You're not tired. You didn't even have kids yet. Don't come at me with how tired you are. (laughs) Y'all going to get me meddling right now. You're 40 years old. Cancel something and start a small group. You're 35 years old. Get to huddle on Sunday morning and say, where can I serve? I'm not looking for the minimum. I got to do something. I got to do something. I got to be involved. I can't keep walking past confused young people. I have to get involved. Listen, even if it costs me something, I'm done, I'm done. Even if it costs me something. Here's the last thing. The Samaritan says this. Samaritan says to the innkeeper, hey, Here's a couple of dollars. But if you spend any more on him, I'll pay. Look into my eyes. If you're under the age of 50, look into my eyes. We have to learn to pay. There's going to be some sacrifice. There's going to be some stuff that we go, no, I actually had to cancel that so I could be faithful to church. I actually had to move my schedule around so I could do this. No, I had to rearrange my budget so I could tithe first. Guys, it's going to cost us something, but that's what Jesus has called us to do. If you're going to make a difference in your life, it's going to cost me something. I'm going to have to give up something. I'm going to have to give up a Wednesday night. I'm going to have to give up sleeping in on Sunday but I get to change the world. And he, and he tells them, hang on, I got no voice. And he tells them, they're doing the right thing, it's me. And he says, hey, look, if he does anything else, now listen, I know this, this guy's like me. He don't stay in the Red Roof Inn. My brother ain't staying at a Hampton Inn. Because, here's how I know, because the, the good Samaritan says, if he needs anything else, well, what else would he need? I think he probably said something like this. If he gets room service, put it on my tab. If this brother goes to the spa, y'all know what kind of places I stay in. Are y'all with me on this, everybody? I told y'all at the beginning, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in my comfort era. All right, everybody? I love a good holiday inn, but I'm gonna need a little room service in my life, all right? Whatever he needs, I'll pay. Look at me. You don't get to decide. You don't get to decide. This is how much compassion. What's the bare minimum? No, I'll do everything I can. I'll max out compassion and love. Jesus ends the story saying, go and do likewise. Stand up all over the house. I'll do more than I have to, God. Bow your heads. Come on, we got to pray. I'll do more than I have to. I'll do more than I'm asked to. I'm not looking for the cheap way out. Every every head bowed, every eye closed. Open your hands before the Lord. Come on. Ask the Holy Spirit this question. What are you asking me to do? Who's hurting around me? Who's who's beside me? What, What need am I passing by? Don't be like the priest that says, I just can't get involved. I'm just too busy. I got too much on me. No, no, no. I never have too much on me to serve I, don't be like the Levite who says well I want to I see it I want to be informed I just don't want to be involved no I got to get involved I got to do something Holy Spirit come on ask him God what do you want from me God what area of my life what, what, what area are you trying to use me what need am I passing by day after day what need in my office what need in my neighborhood what need in my church family what need what need am I passing by God give us a church full of people who stop and serve 
who stop and serve, who stop and serve, who stop and serve. I got to do something. I got to lead a classroom. Third service is overwhelming. I got to lead a classroom. I got to be on the parking team. I got to do. I got to be on the serve team. I can't just come to serve day every July. I got to. I got to be on the serve team in August. I got to keep serving young mothers at the Pregnancy Resource Center. I got to keep showing up for young people. I, youth camp wasn't enough. I got to keep showing up in these young people's lives. So when they graduate, they got a relationship with God. I got to. I got to do something. I got to do something. We're in revival. I got to do something. I can't just come and consume every night. Maybe I'll help. Maybe I'll show up early. I got to do something. I can't just listen to good music. I got to be involved. I got to do something. 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 I got to do something to make a difference. That's the heart of a servant. That's the heart of a servant. Keep your head bowed, your eyes closed. I want to lead you to Jesus today. If you're in church, I never like to close the service without giving you an opportunity to put your faith in the Lord if you're lost today there's two people that know that you and God I've never met somebody who's far from God that doesn't know they're far from God and the truth of the matter is if you're far from God today God didn't move you did but what I love about the God of the Bible is you can always come home you can always start over we call it a a fresh start. You can always have a fresh start today with God. And if you need that, this prayer is for you. And I don't want you to feel alone or isolated. It's our whole church to pray with you. So with your head bowed, your eye closed, from the depths of your soul, out loud would you say, Lord Jesus, thank you for dying for me. You rescued me when I was in a ditch. Thank you that God raised you from the dead so I could live eternally. I give you my whole life today. I repent of my sins, my past, my mistakes, my habits, things I've held on to, anger, unforgiveness. Forgive me. I give you my future today my hopes, my dreams, my family. Come on, this is the part you pray between you and the Lord from the depths of your heart. Say, save me today. Forgive me today. Cleanse me today. Make me brand new. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. I give you my whole life for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, everybody shout amen. Come on, give God praise today for us.